what would God do if we just let him? Yes. He wants to do more than we can imagine. And he, he always does. And uh, I, I'm just believing that this is going to be a turning point in your life. Amen. Come on. If you'll accept it. Amen. You know, I... This reminds me of the first sermon I preached about 70 years ago. Um, I was just a boy, and a, a bunch of kids had gotten the Holy Ghost, I think 57 in that revival, and uh, the oldest one was 12, and I was younger than that. One man said, all we had was a snotty nose revival. <laughs> oh, right. But out of that snotty nose bunch of kids, 27 preachers come out of that room. I was one of them. And as it stands today, I'm the last one of the 27 alive. I remember that day how it was packed and the first message I preached we we didn't have nowhere to have church and so I just told all the kids I said y'all get up in the chicken house and they all got on the roost <laughs> <laughs> and I preached to them <laughs> hadn't quit since oh lord have mercy God wants to do something in our lives and um Let, let me read a scripture so you say I preached at least. First Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 9. First Chronicles 22 and 9. Behold, a son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in, in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee and prosper thee and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he has said for thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Then shall thou prosper if thou taketh heed to fulfill the statutes and the judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, and dread not, nor be dismayed. I, I want to talk to you tonight on the subject, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to live like that. Now, just because it's a little device I'm reading, I don't mean it's going to be a little sermon. <laughs> it don't, even mean, don't even mean it's going to be short <laughs> but um, I'll try to get y'all out by midnight <laughs> you can be seated uh, you know some people think that they're uh, pressed into a corner and they, they'll never get out of it but I'm telling you, you don't have to live like that. No. Because God uh, knows what to do where we're concerned. Yeah. You know, uh, I have uh, some things that I've written down uh, that God has done in, in a few years past, all the way up until this, this very 
actually this week. But uh, I, I was in Lake Charles, and uh, I was preaching, and this man stood up and he said, Preacher, you say God can do anything. I said, Well, yes, sir. He said, I, I've been without a job for two years, and I need a job. And I said, Okay. Uh, I said, do you uh, go to the union hall? He said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm a union worker. And I said, uh, is, do you go up there every day looking for a job? He said, yes, sir. He said, uh, as a matter of fact, there's about three or 400 in that union hall every week or every day waiting on a call for a job. And I said, well, let me tell you what to do. I'm going to give you some instructions, and you follow me, okay? And I said, in the morning, you get up, and you go to the union hall, and there won't be another soul show up. You'll be the only man there. They'll have 15 or 20 dozen donuts and all the coffee you can drink <laughs> because there's generally three or 400 men there. But God's going to let every one of them sleep in in the morning. Praise God. And so when they get a call for a job, you'll be there, yeah. and they'll have to send you out. Come on. Amen. Well, that's the union rules. Thank you, Lord. So he, after church, he comes up to me and said, Preacher, you know, I, I've been up there week after week, and uh, they always call someone out and send them out on the job. And I said, yeah. You don't believe what I told you? You don't, you don't believe God can make every one of them sleep in in the morning? He said, well, that seems impossible. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You show up. You can have all the donuts you want. Drink all the coffee you want. And sometimes before lunch, there'll be a call for a job. And I said, uh, then... Since you're going to be the only one there, they'll let you go out on that job. Yes. Amen. So the next morning, he showed up like I asked him to. And uh, the people at the union hall, they said, uh, what in the world's going wrong here? <laughs> There's not a person showed up but you. And you hit the coffee pot several times and <laughs> eat more donuts than you can hold. <laughs> he said, uh, I was told this is the way it would be today, and so it's going to be my job when the call comes in. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's it. So somewhere around 1030 that morning, <coughs> they got a call that they wanted a, a carpenter, and he went out. And the last I heard from him, he was still working on that job. Making God pay. Oh, Lord, have mercy. But, but some people don't believe God does things like that. He, he knows exactly what that man needed, and so he took care of him. You know, it's not always good if you don't respond. Had he not gone, he wouldn't have had that job and may have never got another job. I mean, I don't know. But when God gives you instructions, so you're going to hear a message tonight that's going to give you instructions on what to do. And I hope that all of you will follow and uh, let God be the best thing that ever happened to you. Amen. You know, uh, I was preaching in Houston, Texas, and uh, that night there was a boy there that I, I told him, I said, son, this is your night. And uh, he didn't respond, and so when I dismissed the service, I walked back to him. I said, son, you're, you're a good boy. I said, uh, and you act like you, you love the preacher. He said, well, I do. I said, but you've never made a, a move towards God. He said, oh, I am. I, uh, I, I love this church. I love, 
I love you, and uh, I'm going to be a part of this. I said, well, I, I got some good news and some sad news. You can come pray tonight, and it'll be wonderful. But if you don't pray tonight, you won't ever be back. He said, oh, preacher, I'll show you. I'll be back tomorrow night. I said, no, if you walk out that door, that's the last time you'll ever enter this church. He was 18 years old, and he should have given his life to God that night. But he walked out, him and his buddy who was sitting there, and they walked up the street from Irvington about two blocks, and they met a gang coming out of Houston. And when that gang saw them, they opened fire with a machine gun and mowed him down. He took on 32 bullets 15 minutes after he walked out the door. Now, he could have been preaching the gospel today, but he made a bad choice. You don't have to live like that. You're here. And, and you're here uh, as God has, has led you to be here. And uh, I hope you're not disappointed at the preacher you have to listen to tonight. <laughs> but uh, I've been down that road several times trying to get people to turn to God. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. But when people will listen, God will do great things for them. Whether it's in Lake Charles or, or whether it's in Beaumont, Texas. It, you know, when, when God wants to do something, you know, uh, for years I wore trifocal glasses. And um, here about a year ago, I, I couldn't see out of them and I pulled them off. And uh, I didn't need them anymore. I, I couldn't see the whites of your eyes. Uh, but uh, I bought me some $3 Walmart glasses <laughs> to read when writing's too little for me, so I kind of need them on this thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, God wants to do something special here tonight. Amen. So uh, I'm, I'm just telling you, if God will take care of a man... And I, I told him, I said, all you got to do is worship the Lord. He said, well, man, I, I don't have much left in me to worship right now. I said, I've, I've been without a job, and I'm, I've, I've suffered, and I've lost a lot of things. And I said, but tomorrow, your world's going to change. Amen. And for him, it did. Amen. Tonight, it can be the same for you. Because God can turn things around. Amen. You know, I was uh, a uh, lady in our church, uh, Sister Bozeman and David. Uh, they'd been married for several years and uh, wanted a child, but the doctor told them not to ever have a child because uh, in that family, there was severe deformities born. And it went from generation to generation. And Deanne, uh, the doctor says, don't ever have a child because it skipped your generation. <clears throat> but this particular thing, it skips one and then it hits the next. And it right. skips one right. and says, if you have a child, and so then she was with child mm -hmm. and she wept she wept all the way through the nine months and uh, x-rays showed bad things the doctor advised her to have a, an abortion and I, I told her I said no I said, God can change things. I said, the doctor said don't do it. But God has blessed you with a child that's on the way. And when this child gets here, he's going to take care of things. Oh, Lord. The night she went in the hospital, that they called me and asked me if I would come up there. And I got there, and she was weeping again. And I looked around, and 
Man, that waiting room was full of people. <coughs> Not family, but people. One man, um, I better not give his name. Somebody might know him, but uh, he, he was there, and he said, uh, I said, what are you doing here, Ray? He said, well, you know, I know this family, and I know what's supposed to happen, and I know what you said wasn't going to happen, and I want to be here and look you in the eye when that baby is born. Oh, and I swallowed hard. And she was in labor now. And uh, a little bit, the doctor walked out. And here was the parents, and here was Ray and all of these other folks. And, and uh, he, he, he walked out, and he passed by the father and the grandmother and grandfather. And he walked over to Ray and he says, it's a perfect child, sir. Oh, <laughs> and the doctor didn't know what, the doctor had no idea who Ray was. And uh, I turned to him, I said, how you like those apples? <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. And you know, when God says, says he's gonna do something, why don't we just believe it? God says he's going to send a revival to this church. Come on. Let it be your family. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. It, it, might as well, it might as well be you that gets the blessings of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. And I, uh, I, I'm not going to go into all of it, but I have 27 typewritten pages of these kind of things. And I, I just started putting them together. And so uh, it, it'll be 200 pages when I get all of them in. But you know, if, if God could stand Ray off to the side. You know, uh, one day Ray uh, said, Brother Bourne, I want to take you fishing. Well, I'm, I'm an on and off fisherman. Uh, I've been off for several years. <laughs> but uh, he said, uh, Brother, Brother Bourne, I want to take you fishing. I said, okay, come by and pick me up. So he come by the house and he said, get in the car. We're going to go fishing today. Mm -hmm. He had a pond. He said there was all kind of fish in it. And, and he was a politician also. Mm -hmm. And on the way to that lake or that pond that he had, which was only two miles, it took us three hours to get there. <laughs> Because every house he passed, he'd blow his horn and people come out and he'd <laughs> run his mouth. And there was a there was a five gallon bucket with a hundred minners in it. And I kept watching that bucket. And those minners all died. They turned belly up. After about three hours we got to the pond and uh, he said, Brother Bourne, we're gonna catch a lot of fish here today and I said Oh, by that time, I was tired of fishing, and I hadn't even wet a hook yet. Oh, Lord. And he set that bucket down. He says, oh, my. He said, the minutes is all dead. I said, they ought to be. They've been sitting in that hot sun for three and a half hours. He said, what are we going to do? I said, well, I'll tell you what, Ray. You got me out here, and I really didn't care to go. And now I'm here, and now you got a hundred dead minners. I said, I'll tell you what, hold your hand just like this over that bucket. He said, and he got over that bucket like that. He said, just like this? I said, yeah. I said, all right, now take your hand and just dart it in and jerk it out. Now, I wasn't expecting anything to happen, really. <laughs> but when he run his hand down in that bucket and jerked it out, 100 minutes flipped over and hit the bottom of that bucket. And the three hours that we were at the pond, we had a hard time catching them fellas in that five gallon bucket. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, you don't have to live like that. If God tells you he's gonna do something, do it. 
Amen. Amen. tells you he's going to bless you, accept it. Amen. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord. I was in Oklahoma, and uh, after church one night, we'd gone to eat, and by this time, it was had gotten late, and it was in the morning time, and the pastor was taking me back to the motel where I was staying, and he drove up till it was so dark I couldn't see anything but the headlights of his, of his vehicle. And he pulled over, and he says, let's get out. So I got out, and he said, what do you see? And I said, what do you mean? I don't see nothing. It's too dark. <laughs> he said, uh, well, just ask God to show you. I said, okay. I said, God, I don't know what he brought me out here on this dark road for. But whatever it is he wants to see, would you tell me what it is? And I said, oh, I got it. I said, there's going to be a Walmart sitting right there. I said, the people in your church owns this land. Is that right? He said, yeah. I said, they're going to sell it to Walmart. 40 acres, they're going to get a good price for it, and they're not going to pay tithes, and God's going to take both of them out. Amen. He said, oh, my God. Tonight, there's a big Walmart sitting there, and both the people that owned it didn't pay their tithes, and God took them both out. They didn't get to spend a penny of the money because when they got the money, they were gone. And the grandkids got to spend it. <laughs> anyway. Oh, Lord. I'm trying to skip over some things here. Ocala, Florida, for the Wade Bass. I, I was there when I, I got there to Ocala and first night after I'd preached, we went to the house and we were sitting at the table and uh, everything uh, was going pretty good and talking and and I, I turned and I, there was the pastor's daughter was sitting right across the table from where I was and, and I said uh, are, are you married? She says no. I said well how old are you? And uh, she said well I'm 23 and I said, uh, do you have a boyfriend? She said, no. I said, well, God told me he's fixing to send you one. Yeah. And she said, what does he look like? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I don't know what he looks like, but he's going to come riding into town. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, well, what is it? <laughs> I don't know, uh, but he's going he's gonna to be on a white horse. She said, well, I don't want no cowboy. Uh, Thank you, sir. I, she said, I don't want a cowboy. I said, you got to take what God gives you. <laughs> Come on. She said, well, preacher, she said, you mean he's going to be coming in town and, and on a white horse? I said, well, that's the way I see it. She said, well, when's he coming? I said, he'll be here tomorrow. Oh, I said, has he called you? <laughs> the next morning, this guy called the pastor and says, I, I'm coming to town, and I, I want to talk to your daughter. So he pulled into town on a white Mustang. <laughs> Convertible. <laughs> They now pastor a church up in Missouri. Praise God. They've got four children. My daughter come to me one day. They, they pastor in Bryan College Station. She says, Daddy, I have 65 warts on my hand. My fingernails are coming off. They're under my fingernails. And she said, I need you to pray for me. So I just reached out and got her by the hand. And I said, I curse these warts. Mm -hmm. The next morning when she woke up, the bed laying all around her, those warts had come off. 
every one of them in her hand was as perfect as the other. Wow. Uh, all right. Amen. I'm trying to build your faith a little bit here. God knows what to do where you're concerned and what you're asking for. Uh, sometimes we, we wonder how that it can be. Right. Amen. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Thank you, I was I may have told you this, but I was in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi, and this girl was in a wheelchair and God healed her. She hadn't walked in two years, couldn't stand up, and God completely healed her. Oh hallelujah. Cross Point, Mississippi. Come to church and I, I preached and uh, I, I told him I said God showed me that tomorrow night uh -huh. there's a man yeah. going to come to church and he's going to sit down on that back seat on my left and he's going to sit right by the aisle and I said when when the altar call is given uh, it's going to be his first night here and he's going to get up and start towards the altar. And when he gets halfway up the altar, he's going to have a massive coronary arrest. And right there is where they're going to pick him up. I said, uh, so the next night, the church was packed to capacity. They were standing around the walls. And it was a big church. But the back pew, on the left side, there wasn't a single soul sitting on it. Oh, Everybody come to church and said, I ain't sitting on that seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Lord, have mercy. And I was almost through preaching, and the back door opened, and this man come in, and he looked, and he said, wow, here's a seat. And so he sat down. And everybody in that church went, <laughs> turned and looked, and they turned back around, and I seen someone said, oh, my. Now, we're going to see whether Bourne's telling the truth or not. So I got through preaching, and I give the altar call, and he stood up and started down the aisle. And he got halfway down the aisle, and he grabbed his chest and fell backwards. And I, I ran to him, and he... His death was so violent, his heart apparently bursted. And uh, I, I laid hands on him to pray for him. And when I took my hand off of his head, the pores of his skin had opened up. And when I took my hand off, it was like syrup. It strung out that far. And I said, ooh. I reached in my pocket and I tried to rub that off my hand and 45 minutes we prayed and finally the ambulance come in and they, they brought a stretcher in and they loaded him up and strapped him down and started down the aisle and I, uh, everybody was weeping because they didn't want to see that happen and I, I stopped him I said sir uh, we know he's dead y'all have already pronounced him dead and I said, uh, and I know it's a terrible thing, but you say you're on the way to the funeral home with him. I said, but uh, if there's nothing you can do, nothing I can do, could I, could I have just another minute with him? And uh, I walked up to him, and boy, there were those standing. No one had left the building. Church was over. I mean, that was it. And I, I walked up to him, and uh, there he was on a stretcher, and was... Uh, what do you call those guys for some of them? Paramedics. Uh, paramedics they, they all step back and put their hands behind their back like that. <coughs> and I, I laid hands on them again. I said, God, you told me this was going to happen. You also told me you was going to raise him from the dead. God. And God, if they walk out of here with him, what is that going to do for this church and for this revival? And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to live. Amen. And he opened his eyes. Amen. 
And he started trying to move, and I said, turn him loose, boys, turn him loose. They unbuckled him. And when he hit the floor, he was running to that altar. And he got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And revival was on. Vercelles, Kentucky. Pastor Terry Gillum, 10-31-21. That's just five months ago. Uh, they brought a lady in that, that Sunday morning. I had a Sunday morning service, and uh, I was leaving, heading on towards uh, uh, Ohio. But they brought this lady in. She looked like she weighed 70 pounds. She was eat up with cancer. She had cancer of the spine. She couldn't stand up. She couldn't walk. And they, they rolled her in, and then they picked her up and brought her up to the front and said, Preacher, can you pray for this lady? And I said, Well, I will. And I looked there, and I said, Oh, my God, have mercy. I had seen another person who weighed 65 pounds, and God raised them up. And here this lady weighs 70 pounds and didn't have any hair on her head from her treatments. And uh, I, I had prayer. And then I left. It was this week I got a call from Brother Gillum. And I said, Brother Gillum, uh, that lady was there that night. Uh, he said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I said, do you have any report on her? He said, oh, oh, yeah, Brother Bourne. Uh, God healed her that morning. He said, she, she weighs 110 pounds now. Her hair is grown out. She's, she's been to the cancer doctor, and they said, all the tumors were, that were in her head is gone. So she's shouting the victory. Hallelujah. Supposed to be heading that way again in about ten days, and so we'll have another miracle. My Lord, have mercy! If God could do it in Vercelles, Kentucky, I guess I'm saying that right. V e r s a l l e s, Vercelles, Kentucky. He can do it right here in Beaumont. He can do it for you where you're sitting. I was in Longview, Texas, and this this lady um, named Pat. We were having church, and she was sitting on the side aisle. And it was, I believe there was three or four aisles in that church. I'm trying to remember. Uh, anyway, she was sitting back on the fifth or sixth pew against the wall and um, I turned to the pastor and I said what's that girl's name back there and uh, the pastor told me her name's Pat and I said Pat and she said yes sir I said the Lord told me that he would bless you mightily if you'd get out now and dance I mean I didn't get through the word dance because she jumped over her husband <laughs> and hit the aisle dancing. And I, you know, I, I've seen a lot of wild people, but I, I've never seen anybody quite that wild. She shouted until she couldn't stand up. And finally, in front of the pulpit, she fell out in the floor and she just she couldn't walk anymore. She doesn't shout it down, but she just laid there and kicked. I, I turned to Brother Spears and I said, he said, your revival. I said, I ain't got nothing to say. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So, uh, about 
35 minutes, I just stood there and watched her, and the people were watching her too. And I, I, I told someone, I said, set her up. And they set her up. She couldn't stand up. Uh, she had shouted herself completely down. I said, I said, lady, you know, I, I don't get used to seeing people respond like you responded, but I got some good news for you. Whatever you ask for tonight, oh God will give it to you. And I, I turned again to the pastor and said, isn't that right? He said, it's your revival. <laughs> And she turned to the lady and she said, y'all help me up. They helped her up and she sat down on the altar and I said, uh, just tell us what you want. She said, I am a maid at the hospital. And she said, I can have what I want? I said, yes, you can. She said, well, I'm going in the morning. The assistant administrator of the hospital is open. They don't have one and I'm going after that one. I almost swallowed my Adam's apple. <laughs> because, man, here she's been mopping floors for 14 years at this hospital. And that's all, making minimum wages. And she's going in in the morning and approaching the director of the hospital for the assistant administrator's job. And, uh... <laughs> I, I, I walked back around. I said, all I can tell you is go for it. <laughs> so the next day, she got her best little dress and best shoes she had, which wasn't much. And uh, she went to work, and she hung them in a closet. And when the administrator got to the hospital, uh, she slipped in the closet and changed out of her little green uniform and uh, went and knocked on the door of the administrator and uh, he opened the door and he said, Pat, what, what's going on? She said, I, I want to apply for the assistant administrator's job today. Ooh, Amen. And he said, well, I, I, I'll give you an application and you can just turn it back in to me. And she said, no, I want to fill it out at your desk right now. <laughs> He said, come on in. <laughs> and so she filled out the application, and she stood up to, to leave, and he, she said, now, when does the hospital board meet? He said, matter of fact, we're having a meeting today at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. And said, um, and she said, so you're going to present this to the hospital board? And he said, um, well, yeah, I, I'll present it to the board. So at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, I don't remember exactly exact time, but uh, the hospital board met, and the director, he went through all the things that he had to go through, and when he got to the end of their meeting, he said, uh, I've got one more little item I need to present to you. That lady out there in the hall, y'all know her. Y'all have known her for years. She's uh, been mopping floors. Uh, she's still on minimum wages. And said, she'd give me an application for the assistant administrator's job. And uh, she made me promise that I would present this to the board. So I did it. Is there anything before we dismiss this meeting? One of the men raised his hand. He says, I, I make a motion that we vote by secret ballot on this particular subject. And so he said, okay. Another man seconded the motion. They, they each got a ballot and wrote on it and put it in a little box. And the administrator, uh, while they were doing that, he says, I I'm, I'm going to vote for her because all these years she's been working for me. I'll tell her when we get through, uh, at least I voted for you. 
And so she can't be mad at me because she's already put me on the spot. And so the other board members, they were sitting there and they said, each one of them, without saying it out loud, you know, uh, I'm going to vote for her. But nobody else would vote for her. They, they know better to vote for her. She she's, don't have the education and said, um, I'll, I'll tell her I, I voted for her. So when they counted the votes, she had all of them. Everybody. Everybody wanted to tell her, at least I voted for you. And the administrator said, what am I going to do? She's not qualified. And you all just voted her in as assistant administrator. You don't have to live like that. Hallelujah. He, he sent one of the men out in the hall and said, Pat, could you come in? We need to talk to you. And so they told her what had happened, and she turned white. And her legs started trembling. She said, oh, my God. I don't know what to do. I've, I've never written a letter. I don't know how to write a letter. And uh, so she got to church at night and she was crying. She said, preacher, she said, uh, they voted me in as assistant administrator of that hospital and I, I need the help of God. I said, well, don't you think if God had them to vote you in, he's going to give you peace of mind on what to do. So the next morning, she, she put her best little uniform on that she had at her house and went to work, and uh, she got there, and she was sitting in that office, and she was saying, man, what am I going to do? And the administrator knocked on her door and said, uh, Pat, we, I need to uh, need you to do a letter for me, and I want to dictate it to you. And she said, oh, my God. <laughs> she got a piece of paper and a pencil. And uh, he started talking so fast. And she said, I, I didn't know shorthand. I, I couldn't write fast. So I just started scribbling. <laughs> and he, he watched me, and I just... <laughs> She went back to her office and laid her head over on the desk and said, God, you're going to have to interpret this for me because I don't know what, I, don't know what I wrote down. And so she said, God, help me. And she started typing. You know, she didn't have typing skills. So when she got through, she folded the letter up and said, God, I'll lose my job over this letter <laughs> because I don't know if I got it like he wanted it written and I've, I've got to mail it off and she mailed it uh, about three weeks she had written this letter to a doctor at another hospital uh, another administrator at another town and he called her and he said uh, are you Pat? she said yes I am he said, I, I got this letter from you. It's got your name on it from the hospital. He said, um, uh, I, I've never seen a letter like this. She said, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. It's the first letter I've ever written. <laughs> and she said, I, I'm sorry. If it's that bad, uh, I'll, I'll try to rewrite it. He said, no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. He said, who, who taught you how to write? She said, sir, no one told me how to write. I don't know how to write. He said, uh, I I've never seen a letter like this. And she said, again, she said, I'm sorry. He said, uh, you know what, uh, Pat, uh, would you come to work for me? And she said, well, I, I got a good job. <laughs> I'm making more than I've ever made in my life. He said, uh, I'll give you $100 a week more if you come work for me. And she said, just a minute. She laid the letter down. And so
she walked into the administrator's office and she said, sir, Dr. So-and-so is on the phone and he, he won't know if I'd want to come to work for him and said, I thought I'd come ask you about it. And he said, well, what did he say? He said, he offered me $100 more than you paying me. He said, well, I'll match that because I intend to keep you. <laughs> she said, well, thank you. And she walked back in her office, picked up the phone. She said, look, I thank you for the raise. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. He said, I'll raise that a hundred bucks. She said, just a minute. She walked back into the doctor's office and said, uh, Dr. So-and-so told me if I'd come to work for him, he'd raise that to $200 a week more than you're paying. I mean, I thought I'd ask you about that. He said, well, I intend to keep you, Pat, so I'll raise that to the 200. She said, thank you, sir. <laughs> she walked back in her office and picked up the phone and said, sir, I'll thank you for a $200 a week raise. He said, I'll raise it 100 She said, just a minute. She walked four times. She walked in and out of that office and each time got a $100 a week raise. She was already making more than she'd ever made. About six weeks, Sister Born. Maybe a little longer than six six weeks. I, I looked up one day where I was pastoring there in Houston. And, uh, there sit. Pardon. Maybe three months. Anyway, she was sitting on the front seat of the church. I said, Pat. She said, Yes, sir. I said, You know, you're not supposed to be here. You got a church, and what are you doing in Houston? Mm -hmm. She said, sir, uh, I, I, I can explain if you'll let me. I said, okay, you owe an explanation because you got a church in, in um, Longview, and that's where you're supposed to be, and I'm fixed to call your pastor <laughs> because you're not supposed to be here. She said, sir, uh, uh, I, I'm here. I said, well, what are you doing here? She said, I'm buying hospitals. I said, you're doing what? I said, how many of these things have you bought? She said, 43. And I said, and you're here to buy more? She said, yeah. And I said, well, go buy them. Oh, Lord, now, Pat has retired. She owns one of the larger homes in Austin, Texas. And she's built a house right on the top of that mountain overlooking the city. Oh, oh, oh. Lord have mercy. Money was never a problem after that for her. A minimum wage girl. Oh. Uh, her husband was sitting there beside her, and I said, what's he doing here? She said, I hired him. Uh, oh, Lord. And we think God can't hear our prayer. Come on, come on. Come on. Sometimes it's not our prayer, it's our response when he gives us a chance. When I looked at her that day and I said, Pat, God wants you to respond. Oh, hallelujah. And, and, I, and I know uh, you're not going to do it, so I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but... If, if you would respond yeah. Come on. when God gives you a chance, don't worry about what someone behind you who's not worth their salt Come on. that thinks about you and, and thinks, well, 
What in the world's wrong with her? She lost her mind? You don't have to act like that. Yeah. No, you don't have to act like that. I was in Ohio preaching, and uh, I had not told that story, and so I, I was telling, and this lady sitting on the back seat, she stood up, and she said, she raised her hand. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, was that Pat? I said, yes, ma'am, because I hadn't used her name. She said, that's my sister. Oh, wow. And she come walking down the aisle, and she walked up to the altar, and she turned around and faced the congregation. She said, everything this man has said is exactly the truth. And then she turned around and knelt at the altar, and God filled her with the Holy Ghost. The next night... The next night, she had her three sons there, and they got the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And the next night, those three sons had their wives there, and they got the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. And, 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 and we think God can't do what we ask Him to do. Sometimes we ask Him, and then we look at Him and says, Aren't you going to do it, God? And the best thing we should do, or the thing that would probably get a response out of God, is giving a response to God. So, uh, my family told me, you, you've been sick, you need to stay home and just relax. And I said, well, I, I can relax better in the pulpit than I can at home. <laughs> And so uh, I'm just going to go. Well, you're not able. I said, uh, I'm not able, but uh, I'm not able to sit there on a couch all day either. Mm -hmm. That'd be worse than right. going fishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Come on. Come on. You know, I done used up a whole page, and I got 27 pages here. Come on. But I, I'm not going to go through all of that. But, uh, each one of these things is similar. They're different, but they're similar. Some are terrifying what God done. Some are just like Pat. And God is able to do it wherever you are. I know, uh, I'm thinking of one church in particular. I, I preached there when they had uh, a third of what we got here tonight. Pastor didn't know if he'd ever survive, uh, but when it broke, it broke. I, I told him one night, I said, man, I'm excited. He said, what about? <laughs> I said, God just told me 200 and, uh, 260, 267 would, 267, anyways, right at 270. I said, that many people are going to get told of us in one service. And he said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I'd like to know we had 270 in our church. And here we got 25. And you said 270 is going to get told of us. He said, I can't handle that. I said, well, good. I'll leave. I'll go where someone can handle it. So I, I left. I loaded up my stuff and I got in the car and I left. I said, you don't believe it? Don't worry about me. You won't have to worry, you won't have to worry about seeing me again. I promise you that. So I left. In desperation, several months later, he, he got a flatbed trailer, set it up in front of a big apartment complex there in Indiana. And he said, uh, we were so desperate we would just, if we could just get a few of the people out of that apartment, come out and listen to us, sing to them, and then invite them to church. And, and he said, we got out there and set that uh, flatbed up and got our musicians, and we started singing. And that uh, very large complex, uh, he said, everybody come out. The street was blocked. 4,000 people had gathered around. And uh, the police got there, and they said, y'all can't do this. And he said, well, you disperse them. We didn't bring them out here. We just started singing, and they come out. So uh, they're here now. So, And the Holy Ghost fell, and 270 got the Holy Ghost. And in one service. Now, how 
they run 700. God can do things for you. He does for me. He, he raised me up when the doctor says you'll never talk or walk, and then you'll you'll not get out of this hospital. You're you're here. This is the end up. This is your last night to live. Uh, you won't make it to daylight. And so, uh, how long goes that, more, Sister Born? Year and a half. Uh, when they told me I wouldn't I wouldn't live. It's been a year and a half, two years. 2019. This is 22. It's been about two and a half years. Anyway, here I am. Amen. Strong as an ox. And declaring what God can do. And he's still doing it. I say he's still doing it. You don't have to live like that. is going to be born to you and his name shall be Solomon and there's going to be absolute peace in your land and nothing is going to happen to stop it so when your son gets old enough to take the kingdom he said you give him the instructions that I'm giving you now so in the song of Solomon chapter 3 and verse 6 who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like a pillar of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and the powers of the merchants? Behold, his bed, which is Solomon's, threescore valiant men are about it of the valiant of Israel, and they hold swords, be an expert in war. Every man has his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. Mm. Come on. Solomon was told as long as you serve God there'll be peace oh Lord have mercy I'm going to skip down to the bottom all right I got several pages here okay David says, I, I, I've gathered up the money for you, and you're going to build a king. You're going to build a, a church for me. He said, the Lord told me I couldn't do it, so um, I, I went back and I, I dug this out the best I could, so I'll quickly go through it. He said, you're going to build a church for me. You get the money together, and you give it to your son Solomon, and as long as he serves me, there's going to be peace. Oh, he'll get up in the morning. Don't have to worry about a thing. He said, when you get all the things gathered together, uh, then he'll start the building, and he'll never have to worry about the funds because uh, this is what I want you to do. I, I use the figure $1,500 for one ounce. Actually, gold went up to $2,000 an ounce just a couple of weeks ago. I think it dropped back maybe to 1900 I don't know what. So I used the figure $1,500 just, just to be in the, so you wouldn't think I was exaggerating. <laughs> so he said, uh, one pound or 16 ounces at $1,500 is $24,000 a pound. And he said, uh, I'm going to give you a thousand talents of gold. A thousand talents. A talent is 66.9 pounds. 66.9 for uh, $24,000 an ounce. And there's 66.9 ounces uh, in a talent is one million. 605,000 and he said I'm going to give you 1,000 or 100,000 talents 
And so one million six hundred and five thousand six hundred dollars times one hundred thousand talents is one hundred and sixty billion five hundred and sixty million dollars just in gold. He said, now, I'm, I'm going to give you a little silver to go with that. Uh, silver, I'm going to use the term $35 an ounce. It, I, I believe it went up to $40 an ounce or $42. Um, I, I couldn't buy an ounce, so. <laughs> One pound or 16 ounces at $35 is 560 uh, one pound, 16 ounces, is at $35, is $560. $560 times 66.9 pounds is $37,464 per uh, talent. The Babylonian talent of silver is 66.9 ounces, and it was 37464 and he had one million talents. This, I read this in the Bible. One million talents is 37 billion, 464 million dollars. And he had everything he needed to do what God wanted him to do, but he failed. And because he failed, here he is supposed to be in a land of peace. He's supposed to be in a land of peace. And now here he is, because he has failed, he has to have, how, how many did I say gathered around his bed? Three score. That's 60. 60 valiant warriors, the most valiant of the country, lined around his bed every time he laid down to take a sleep at night because he was fearful of the night. And God said, I'm going to give you peace like you've never seen before in your life. Oh, you don't have to live like that. You, you don't have to go home wondering how. If you quit worrying about how you're going to make it tomorrow and trust God and do what he wants you to do and that's rise up in the morning with your hands in the air saying, God, I want to thank you for another day. Hallelujah. And when you give thanks to him, hallelujah, God will give you the same promise that he gives Solomon through his son David. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, lost the place here. Give me just a minute here. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you. again. One ounce of gold at $1,500. That's worth more than that now. And one pound is 16 ounces. 16 times 1,500 is 24,000. And $24,000 a pound and a, a, a talent is 66.9 pounds. And that's $1,605,600. And there was a uh, 100,000 talents times 1,605,600 makes a total of 160 billion, 560 million. That's just, that's just in the uh, gold and then the silver. And it says, and besides all the other metals that he had. And I didn't even go into that. So uh, 
and you worrying about how you're going to make your car note. Come on. And you don't pay your tithes. And Come you on. Don't, you don't give when God tells you. Someone comes along and they, they have a need, and you see someone and you say, and the Lord says, Why don't you buy them a bill of groceries? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you look at them and you say, I need groceries myself. If you would do that little thing, That's when God right. says, Amen. Just buy them. Yeah. Just. Yeah. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. One preacher told me, he says, I, I was working as a bricklayer, and he said, uh, One day God told me, He says, uh, go by the store and uh, buy something for the pastor. So he went by the store and, and he said, well, what do I get? And I said, the Lord spoke to him. He says, get a pound cake. Help me with this, Sister Bourne. Uh, he, pound cake? Angel food cake. A dozen eggs and some bacon. And he would take it by the pastor's house and he would say, uh, Pastor, uh, I just want to give you this. What was it again, Sister Bourne? A pound of bacon, a dozen eggs, and an angel food cake. And he he gave that pastor that. He said, the Lord told me to give it to you. And the pastor started weeping. He said, my wife says, we don't have any groceries. We don't have an egg. Come on. He said, ah. Uh, I would love to have a pound cake, oh, yeah. but we don't have that. And so for two years, Brother Slade would go by the grocery store. Thank you you know Brother Slade. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, he would go by the grocery store and he'd get uh, a dozen eggs Thank you, Lord. and a pound cake Thank you, Lord. And, and a pound of bacon uh -huh. and give it to the pastor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And then years later, Brother Slade was called to preach and he was pastoring a church and they had their backs against the wall and didn't know how they was going to make it and someone knocked on the door and said pastor the Lord told me to go by the grocery store and buy you some groceries and they opened it up and it was a pound of bacon <laughs> an angel food cake and a dozen eggs and for two and a half years they brought him an angel food cake and a dozen eggs and we think when God tells us you know I, I, I don't know about your neighbor I don't know what, what they may need but if God tells you to go uh, buy that or, or, or go fill up their tank with gas now boy that, that would be quite a chore uh, Especially if you filled up my truck. <laughs> my Lord. My grandson told me the other day he stopped and filled up his truck and it cost $173. And so I said, Dear God, have mercy. Let me sell my truck. <laughs> oh, Lord. But God wants to take care of people. And I know I've, I've, I've gone way over. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I, 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 I'm fixing to quit. If I can, but if God tells you to, uh, and you might think they got more than you, to, and they may have more than you, but that's not the fact. If God tells you to go and help your neighbor and uh, buy him a dozen eggs and a uh, pound of bacon and a angel food cake or whatever He tells you, do it because the day may come. When you need a dozen eggs and an angel food cake. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I, I thank the Lord for that car out there that God gave me just two weeks ago. And, I, and that was the 17th car that's been given to me since 1997, 96, 97. Anyway, that's the 17th car. That's been given me. I haven't had to buy a car. Uh, but you know, uh, as I was a younger man, the Lord would say, why don't you give your car to this preacher? And I gave away uh, 14 cars. One I just bought, made one payment on it. And the Lord says, that man needs a car. And I said, God. <laughs> 
I've only made one payment on this and I can't pay it off. And so I made 35 more payments on it. Yeah. Finally, I walked up and handed him the title to it. Yeah. But 14 times I'd done that. Uh -huh. And my wife said to me one day, she says, when are we going to see this thing turn around? Yeah. <laughs> we've bought cars and we've given to preachers and home missionaries and missionaries. And, mm -hmm. and, but when it turned, since 96, I haven't had to buy a car. Amen. 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 You know, I, I wasn't able to go buy a new car, so I just, I, what I had, I'd just give it to him, and God would help me get another, and I'd, and it, but what he gave me has been, man, uh, I wish I knew what kind of car it was, and, uh, I called it a Pujo. <laughs> That's all I had when God said, give your car away. So I, I give it to this man, and uh, I hope he got home. <laughs> but God gives me the best. And he's helped me through the years, and he's still helping me. And I'm telling you, if you get off of it, if it's not but a dozen eggs and a pan of bacon and an angel food cake. Man, one day you might need that. And when it comes in, you say, oh my God, here she goes. Hallelujah. Boy, I had a young evangelist with me one day and, and uh, he said, Brother Bourne, I've, I've, I've heard you talk about what God done and I give things to you and he said, uh, uh, oh, hallelujah. I, I, I wish I had a watermelon. I said, is that all you want? He said, oh, I'd like to have a coconut cake, too, since I'm going to be able to ask what I want. He said, I'd like a, uh, I'm sorry, chocolate cake. Sister Bourne, she remembers those things, and I have trouble remembering them. But, uh, it was a chocolate cake and a watermelon. So this young evangelist and myself, we went to town, and we got back, and there was a watermelon sitting there and a dish covered up, and it was chocolate cake. And I said, you want anything else, son? Come on. Come on. Whatsoever you ask, in my name, Come on. believing, you shall receive. That is, if, if you respond when God tells you to. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord. Have mercy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I took so long here. But, um, I am. Back here, maybe I'll have 54 pages and I'll have something to say. Oh Lord, I know you're fixing to have to leave here and go home, and uh, it's Saturday, this Saturday, Saturday night. And, uh, you'll get to sleep till eight o'clock in the morning and get ready to come to church. Eleven o'clock, is it eleven o'clock? Um, I, I gotta leave soon, church is over because. Got to be somewhere else tomorrow night. Anyway, I, I challenge you. Do what God tells you to do. Sometimes it's not a gift. It's the fact that he tells you, why don't you get down on your knees and pray for your neighbor? I know you don't have any money, but you can pray for them. And God starts blessing them. Yes. And in return, the blessings fall on you. Yes. Come on. Hallelujah. I know I've been sick, but I know God healed me and brought me back. Yes. And it, it, here I am, uh, old as a, this land almost. 
but God's been mighty good to me. Amen. And he's fixing to be good to someone here. Amen. And you know, start to get up on that thing, but I might not ought to do that. <laughs> I have to have someone to hit me down. <laughs> I know God's going to take care of me. bless Pat, or God bless Brother Slade, or God blessed J.J. Bourne, and he helped him beyond measure. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You know, God will help you tonight if you would surrender to him. Sometimes it's, it's nothing more but I don't have anything to give you, Pastor, but uh, God told me to pray for you, and I fell on my knees. But I tell you what, you and your wife, uh, I don't know what your problems are or your blessings are, but uh, uh, No, no, that's not what I'm, what I'm saying is God's going to bless this man. Amen. He may have some blisters on his hands out there working, and I hope the rest of you out there working with him that's going to be here. But uh, if, if not, you can't work, you can give 10 bucks an hour for someone to come work. No, you can't get enough for $10 an hour anymore, can you? Not anymore. Lord, I'm used to what I used to work for. Now I have to have a lot more than that. Just to buy gas, I, I travel so much. <laughs> you know, can I, can I tell you one more story? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm supposed to preach for this guy in the next little while. But uh, maybe maybe I already told it. I don't I don't know. But maybe anyway, um, I was preaching one night and I, I looked at him. I said, "Sir," and I called him by name. What's his name, Sister Bourne? Do you remember? Abby. Um, in Gina, Louisiana. No, I can't remember his name. The little fella, real small a statue. Anyway, I told him, I said, sir, you, you work, you're a superintendent on an oil rig offshore. And I said, uh, when do you go back to work? And that was on Sunday, I said, I, I'm going, I'll be back out there Tuesday morning. No. No. Anyway, let me tell a story. <laughs> anyway, I said, when you get out there uh, on that rig, I said, it's going to explode. I said, it's going to explode. And I said, as quick as possible, you get all the employees into the capsule. I've never been out there, so I don't know what kind of outfit that is, but... You get them in the capsule, and you lunch at capsule out away from that rig because that rig is going to explode, and it's going to burst into flames, and it's going to be real bad. So he said, Brother Bourne, I said, now, I got some instructions for you. Don't you get in that capsule. You stay on the, on the oil rig. And I said, it looks like your life is over because pipe is going to come spewing out of the ground going a quarter of a mile in the air and then falling back on the deck and all around that, that oil rig. And I says, and it, it'll be very bad. I said, first thing you do, you get under a 
heavy metal thing and you call Houston to that man that owns that rig and tell him what's happened. The rig has exploded and we're going down. I've launched the employees into the capsule out into the Gulf. He said, but uh, you, I told him, I said, you stay there. And I said, when it looks like uh, the end has come for you, I said, you crawl out from under that piece of steel that you're under. And I said, you look at that flame and where pipes are shooting up in the air and point at it and say, I command you to stop in the name of the Lord. And I said, the pipe will stop spewing into the air. The flames that are shooting hundreds of feet into the air that's burning that rig down. I said, when you command it to stop burning, I said, God will hear you. And man, right in the middle of all of that, he, he remembered what I told him. You know, he got the men off the rig, and he was there, and he got out. Just as the helicopter from Houston, uh, the man that owned it brought Red Adair, the man who was hired to put out all those flames. And uh, they landed on the rig and got out. And here's uh, that brother pointing at that fire, saying, I'm telling you to stop burning in the name of the Lord. Woo, amen. And those two guys got out of that helicopter and walked over to where he was. And ice started forming around that flame. Mm -hmm. It was a massive flame. And that ice was about almost a foot thick, formed around that fire and went up the side of that flame, 200 feet in the air, and then capped over it. And the owner of that rig, he's looking at that and said, What did you say? What? What, what did you say? He said, I, I just called on the Lord that I serve. He said, you mean you got that much authority with God? He said, yes, sir. He said, this crazy preacher, Sunday night, Gina, Louisiana. Sunday night, he told me this was going to happen. And he told me what to do. And he said to point at the fire and command it to stop burning. Oh, hallelujah. That man looked at him. He says, anybody with that much authority with God, I, I want to help you. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a $10,000 a raise per payday. already the highest paid man on the rig, but he got a $20,000 pay raise per month. I could use a few of those. He retired in four years. I saw him the other day. I'll see him in the next few days. Stand up. Oh, he's smaller than you. Thank you. <laughs> How about it, son? Stand up. Oh, you're too tall. <laughs> Anybody shorter? <laughs> How tall are you, son? Oh, you're too tall, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, can't remember his name. Anyway, anyway, it happened. And the, cap, the owner of that oil rig said, you saved me millions. Red Adair charged a million dollars to come out here and put this fire out, and you just commanded it to go out. And he said, that's one thing, but ice, a thick all the way around the flame and went all the way up the side and covered it up. 
And when we landed the helicopter, it was still burning inside the ice. Uh -huh. He said, anybody's got that kind of power with their God, uh -huh. I want them on my rig. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get in the record books tonight, but if you're feeling like I'm feeling, you wouldn't want to sit down either. Oh, hallelujah. If you felt as good as I feel right now, you couldn't. Come on. Come on. And I know. get that kind of raise but if you're blessed anyway and you realize only God could have done that Come on. <laughs> and I'm telling you only God can do what I'm talking about when you respond to God so sometimes God wants you to just you shout touch would you, would you shout a little bit for me hallelujah something special yes, Come on. I started to say for somebody but this whole church is involved in this tonight. <laughs> on your job Monday or whenever you go back to work Come on. you be filled with the spirit and walk in there knowing that God's on your side and that you believe he's able to do anything hallelujah and you know he's able to do anything <laughs> Sister Bourne, can I tell him how old you are? She's, she'll be 84. No? She's eight. Well, you'll be 84 in two years. 82. She'll be 83 her birthday. And that's just a few days off. But, uh, she loves God. And when God tells me to do something for someone, I, I pass it by her. She says, whatever you feel, do it. Right. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to say this, and I know it's probably not the right thing to say in my closing, but um, the other day uh, I come in and I told my wife, I said, uh, I know it's probably all we got, but I, I want the Lord told me to give this preacher they're struggling and uh, give what I had so she said well sure I said well get your checkbook and just, just give it to him and it was it wasn't ten dollars it wasn't a hundred dollars it wasn't a thousand dollars it was all we had mm -hmm. uh, that particular moment and so we did it and the next place I went guess how much Alton was Exactly what I give. Come on. And I give it every cent back to me. And if you need healing, you give God a lot of praise. And He'll reward you starting from your head down to your feet. And He'll raise you up. Start talking about a 
building that gets real heavy. But God's got some people somewhere around this area that's going to meet the knee. Come on. Come on. Yes. And when they do, they'll be blessed. to come up here, but where you are, could you for just a moment give God all the praise you can give Him?
just wait till we got 250, 300 folks in this place. You think it's intense right now, you just wait till that day. <laughs> and that's not where it's going to stop, by the way. My Lord, have mercy. This is the kind of high that a drug addict is looking for but can't find. And we get it for free. <laughs> Amen. Brother Bourne, thank you so much. My, my, my. While Brother Bourne was preaching, Brother Simmons leaned over to me up here and he said, this man has lived what we just preach about. And that's the truth. We preach faith. We believe faith. This man has lived it. Amen. Lord, have mercy. What, what do you do with a service like this? Spirit sound rushing wind fire been dealing with somebody about stepping into this realm.
us a move of the Holy Ghost is in this house. It's the kind of service that we won't dismiss you from. I know at some point we all have to go home. But be encouraged. Let this build your faith to a boiling point. Let it build your faith. Brother Bourne will be here tomorrow morning. I had uh, kind of hoped I could twist his ear a little bit, get him to stay on a little while. But uh, we've got him scheduled uh, once a quarter for the rest of the year. And if we can get him more than that, we will. God bless you tonight. Go forth in Jesus' name with an encouraged, uplifted heart because God is on our side. Amen. God bless you.
Yeah. <laughs> 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 